The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Director Kranegar. I first want to address a comment made by my colleague from New York earlier in this hearing um, when she said that she believed that you had disrespected Congress for having the audacity of uh, taking the position that the Bureau's structure is unconstitutional, as if the executive branch has no independent responsibility to assess the constitutionality of its actions. Let me just say on behalf of me and my colleagues, I want to thank you for respecting many of us, members of Congress, who believe that the Bureau's structure is unconstitutional. And apparently, the, the en banc panel of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals agrees with you, Director Kraniger, and agrees with those of us in Congress who believe that it's unconstitutional and disagree with the gentlelady from New York uh, as they have uh, held that the structure of the FHFA is unconstitutional because it shares the same defects in its structure as the Bureau. Uh, I would also uh, just make the editorial comment to my colleagues that to the extent that they, uh, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, to the extent that they are frustrated with or, the, or to the extent that they disagree with some of your decisions or worse, to the extent that they refer to you as worthless in violation of House rules, I would invite them to end their stubborn opposition to my legislation that would bring the Bureau under the congressional appropriations process, that would actually bring much needed accountability to the Bureau. Instead of blaming you, I would invite my colleagues uh, that, uh, and I would respectfully submit that they ought to blame themselves because they created an agency. They deliberately designed an agency to elude congressional oversight or accountability. My question, Director Kraniger, to you, uh, though, is, is about UDAP. Uh, as you know, Dodd-Frank gave the Bureau authority over uh, so-called unfair, deceptive, and abusive acts and practices. And while the concept of unfair or deceptive have long histories and regulatory track records, the abusive element is causing some confusion and uncertainty. Uh, in short, the absence of due process about how lenders can comply with UDAP uh, will result in fewer choices for consumers, less competition, higher prices, and ultimately less access to credit for borrowers. Uh, besides the June Symposium, what progress have you made on clarifying the definition of abusive under UDAP? Uh, so I will say the Symposium was the starting point of that conversation, as, as you noted, Congressman, and we received uh, really statements from the experts on it. We benefited from their conversation, and we're looking at that very carefully now to decide what the next steps are. I don't have anything to, to share with you today specifically on that, but, but the record is clear in terms of what that conversation was and is something that I'm weighing carefully. Uh, Director, I'd encourage you to expedite that because due process is counting on you. Um, the small dollar uh, payment provision. When a lender places a loan in collections, that can harm the borrower and limit opportunities for credit rehabilitation. Are you concerned that lenders could react to the payments provisions, uh, provisions of the rule by proceeding straight to collections following the second unsuccessful payment attempt? Uh, I have actually, this is the first time I've heard that concern raised. I know there are other concerns that have been raised about the payments provision. Uh, it's currently stayed by the courts, so it's not uh, in effect yet. Uh, we also have a petition to look at it, uh, but largely, again, our reconsiderations associated with the underwriting provision. Uh, I appreciate you considering that dimension, that, that, that uh, potential unintended consequence. With respect to debit cards in the payment provision, um, uh, they, the, the provisions, as I understand it, would apply when a payment is made through a debit card, even though this method of payment results in no charge to a consumer when there's insufficient funds. Would you consider revising the rule to exclude debit cards since there is no harm to consumers in the debit card context? Uh, we're certainly looking at the petition around the, pay the payments provisions, um, but found that the underwriting provisions had a greater uh, concern in terms of the legal basis and the factual basis for it. So that's why that's the reconsideration part. Well, again, take a look at that because I think there may be some well-intended uh, drafting of this, but some unintended consequences. Finally, disparate impact. As you know, this summer, HUD published its propose, uh, proposal to revise its disparate impact rule under the Fair Housing Act. Um, the HUD proposed rule established a five-part test to assess claims of disparate impact in compliance with the Inclusive Communities uh, decision. 
In its fall 18 rulemaking agenda, the Bureau stated it was considering future rulemaking on the application of disparate impact theory under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. The spring 2019 rulemaking agenda did not mention this effort. Uh, does the Bureau plan to examine how it evaluates disparate impact claims in order to harmonize the standards with those of HUD? I can tell you, Congressman, that we have disparate impact on the symposia agenda, and it's something that we want to have that conversation. Harmonization with HUD would be helpful. Thank you. Yield back. 